my pleasure at this time to introduce our uh, presenter today, Jason Ding. Jason is a chartered accountant and chartered business valuator by training with expertise in the technology industry. He's also worked with national and international public companies in various sectors including biotechnology and life sciences. He runs his own business called H2 Technology Consulting and this business focuses on helping early stage technology startup companies in the area of strategy, finance, accounting, purchase and sales, transactions, licensing, deals and equity and debt financing. So all those things that we in in the research community don't have a lot of exposure to, but we it's very important for us to build our skills in those areas. So uh, Jason is also an executive in residence and program director at Tech Edmonton, which is an allergen partner. It's the technology transfer uh, um, organization for the University of Alberta, but also does those kinds of provides those services for organizations and companies in um, in Alberta and across Canada. And uh, Jason has kindly offered to share his expertise with us today as our initial uh, um, presenter. And he'll help equip us with the business planning know-how that we need to enhance the sustainability and impact of our allergen research. So welcome, Jason, uh, and uh, take it away. Thanks very much, Diane. Uh, so I'm very, very pleased uh, to have the opportunity to, to provide some of my thoughts and, and experience with respect to business planning and how that's relevant in the, in the research space. As Diana mentioned, I'm uh, an executive resident of tech and part of a team of about uh, 65 people now at Tech Edmonton um, focused on technology transfer and commercialization related to companies and, and, uh, and some of the research that comes out of the university here uh, into companies and, and helping them with growing those companies. Uh, and supporting the commercialization commercialization efforts um, that uh, that comes along with that. Um, one of the things that uh, I want to cover off is some key messages associated with um, oh sorry with with today. And so uh, really, the the presentation today is going to focus around the increased need to think about IP value creation. And so that's um, you know, a result of, of changing uh, thinking with respect to granting agencies, uh, certainly funding pressures, um, as well as some, some you know, new opportunities to apply research uh, where there are commercialization opportunities. And so really, um, you know, the, the focus of the presentation will be to talk about some, some business planning tools, uh, where you can find some of these business planning tools and why they're relevant with respect to planning efforts. Valuation of early stage technology is a very, very difficult topic um, to think about you know, how you, you value early stage intellectual property when it's so early in their development. The risks are still very, very high in terms of commercialization associated with getting those products to market. And, and the importance of milestones and metrics and, and the planning associated with product development um, and other metrics related to IP value creation. And, and the result from all of these uh, processes uh, is really to drive to the right pitch, the right uh, way to communicate value for your intellectual property to, to look at um, how you communicate you know, funding opportunities or communicate for funding opportunities or collaboration with industry opportunities, etc. And then finally, the other thing I would suggest is that you use your local innovation system to help. No matter where you are in the country, there's lots of support uh, for, for researchers and for companies and, and I encourage you to access those resources uh, because they really well help to to add to uh, the way that you think about and frame uh, your research. Uh, uh, Diana gave me a fantastic introduction, and so I want to spend a lot of time on this. Other than to say, uh, I'm the program director for the Health Accelerator Program, uh, which means that we are really doing a lot to support uh, life science companies, and um, and that's been able to help inform some of the discussion that uh, that uh, I'll have today. Um, so jumping right in, uh, I think, uh, you know, so the last point first, you know, innovation system clients do better. I'm not going to spend any time on the metrics that are in here other than to say um, that really those that access the resources in the system, and depending on where you're at, you'll have different resources, but, but the consistent theme that we see across the country is that no matter where you are, if you have resources in the system and, and expertise that is diverse, um, from from where you are and in your research interests, uh, the better it is for for the success of, of the research and, and and potentially company. And so uh, this is you know I think a very strong message for us 
uh, all across the country to say, you know, do access your, uh, your resources, your local resources to support your efforts. The, the other thing I want to cover off um, that I think is just as equally important is, you know, we're not, I don't want to talk today about, uh, you know, the importance of the science um, or, or the importance, for instance, of understanding the mechanism of action. I think those are, those are requirements, um, nor of the quality of the team. Um, those are all things that I'm sure all of you can articulate uh, very easily. Um, and I think, you know, really there is uh, an effort um, and a requirement to understand that knowledge translation pathway when applying for funding industry collaborations. And, and I'm not going to cover those, um, these particular topics today, uh, but they are certainly important as part of the overall pitch. So this is this is really where I, would, I do want to start um, with respect to the value proposition pitch. This is a, actually a business card for General, Jennifer Hamilton, who whom many of you may know. Uh, she's with Johnson and Johnson. Uh, she's a technology scout for Canada, based out of Vancouver. Uh, we have a very strong working relationship with her. This is her business card, um, and so you know the front end has, of course, her, her contact information. But on the back, she has some critical questions um, that she hopes that researchers will answer as they present to her with respect to you know their research and their and their innovation. And so you know you can see again that that there are lots of of important questions that she's hoping that will be covered as part of any pitch or any discussion that you have with her. Um, but really today what I want to do is focus on these particular areas around you know understanding you know exactly you know what your product is, the clinical relevance um, and, and the workflow as well in terms of how it might be integrated by a customer or, 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 or the market um, and really understanding what your market is um, and, and the competition in the market and how you differentiate yourself uh, in that market. So, so what is the value proposition associated with the product and how can you communicate that as you're having this discussion with a uh, you know, potential industry partner? Uh, again, not going to spend a lot of time on, on this particular um, page other than to say, you know, there's lots of forms of intellectual property, uh, whether that's, uh, you know, a, a patent, of course, is what a lot of us know, but certainly trade secrets, copyrights, trademarks, uh, industrial design are all intellectual property components uh, to, to a package. And so thinking about what you have as IP uh, and thinking about what assets you have as part of your discussions uh, is relevant and thinking about you know how you might be able to translate some of these some of these I, IP uh, assets into uh, a commercialization commercialized entity or or product um, is useful and I think it's also useful to to start off by by suggesting that there are multiple um, pathways to value creation associated with that intellectual property. Um, you know, lots of us will hear um, about opportunities to patent and then potentially to license. But even within that, there are um, you know different opportunities to look at that that IP and what you might be able to do with it and how you might be able to create value for for that IP for not just industry, not just um, you know collaborators, but for for yourselves as well in terms of how you think about um, you know where you might be able to generate value from from your invention. My plan, um, and really, you know, the, the concept here is that you have, you know, a fantastic technology, um, that you have lots of concepts and you have lots of ideas, but what you need to do is to use business plan um, strategies, business planning tools to, to take all of those different technology concepts and all of those different ideas and to pull them into a, into a coherent approach and into um, something that is, is demonstrable in terms of a value creation strategy with that, with that intellectual property. And, and the business planning tools that are available out there are very useful in being able to do that. Um, and so what I want to do is, is walk through some of those tools um, and, and to give you a high level explanation of how some of them work and why you use them. Um, and then that then can, can help to inform you know, some of the presentations that, uh, that you might put together and how you think about the technology that you're working with. Uh, a, a, a business plan outline. This is something that I think you can find uh, relatively easy in terms of you know executive summary, company overview, uh, product and service description, uh, market analysis, competitive analysis. Um, but you know to, to take that into a little bit more detail, you know here are some of the things that you'll want to think about with your business plan 
um, and uh, and some of the segments that are relevant to uh, some of the work that you might be doing. The uh, the the focus of of the presentation and some of the tools today related to some of these business plan segments um, are really going to focus on on these particular areas: so product and services, uh, market analysis, competitive analysis, and operations. And I think these areas. Uh, are are not thought about very often. I think um, people jump immediately to, you know, what is what is the price of my product going to look like? How do I how do how do I um, you know how, how much do I think I'm I'm going to be able to sell the product for, as well as sort of the market and uh, how do I market this and who's going to buy it and who are my customers? But but it's just as important really to talk about you know segmenting those customers and thinking about um, you know what your market size is. And, and and really drilling down to you know, the, the the sales cycle, for instance, of the product, and how you might be able to get that product to market uh, over a period of time, and what's the impact of your business model associated with uh, how long it takes, for instance, to be able to sell into government, or how long it takes to sell into a large company. Um, competitors, of course, are are another critical piece to to the analysis, and really thinking about competitors with respect to not just you know, those in the space, I, I hear from entrepreneurs all the time that there's there's no competitors um, at all to my product, um, that there are just no competitors that exist. And, and that's generally not the case, um, almost uh, always not the case. Um, and there are very, very few products where there aren't alternatives to, um, to you know, what's currently being done um, or other ways of thinking about the same problem in terms of how those solutions might be solved. And so broadening out your thinking with respect to how competitors might, might look um, and, and what technologies might be out there to, uh, to make yours potentially obsolete is an important part of the thinking that you'll need to do to, um, to think about competitors. So, so jumping into some of the tools, uh, there are lots of of planning tools available to help focus your planning, um, and uh, and these are some of the questions that that uh, these questions uh, these tools will help answer. So so a value proposition design tool um, is is a fairly popular tool. This is part of a set actually. So uh, business model generation, um, which is the book that you see there, um, was uh, was one of the first books that uh, was recently created around um, designing a business model, and you'll see. That tool will come up a little later. They came up with a second book called Value Proposition Design, um, which really is focused on the value proposition of the product, and, and that then flows into the business model. So, so again, this particular tool um, is about, uh, and, and the entire process with respect to value proposition is really understanding, you know, what needs are you solving with your product? Um, you know, what are the benefits with respect to the products that you're developing or the, the service that you're developing? And how is it better than um, existing products? Eat from a customer perspective, with respect to um, you know what what they what they need, what they're concerned about, what what might keep customers up at night related to a specific issue, uh, and how you so help solve those fears, as well as substitutes. And so these substitutes uh, again relate to competition. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about another tool um, that might be useful um, to talk specifically about that. But, but again, this this is uh, quite a useful tool um, with respect to to thinking about how your product is beneficial, and and when talking to you know pitching to for instance angel investors, when pitching to um, investors, uh, uh, really understanding the value proposition of your product uh, or your technology is critical to being able to sell this concept um, to uh, to your potential funders or industry partners. On the competition side, uh, the Portis Five Forces tool uh, is, a, is a very, very popular tool to think about uh, competitors. So when you think about competitors and you think about the nature of competitors, uh, there's lots of different places where competitors can come from. So uh, the threat of new entries, this would be new products that would be disruptive to potentially what it is that you are, are developing. And so how do you think about, um, how do you think about new, uh, new entrants? Uh, and, and new disruptive technologies that may displace yours. Um, supplier power and, and buyer power are sort of two sides of the same coin associated with um, the impact of suppliers um, and what they might have to your business. If you're thinking about um, you know, a, a new therapeutic, 
um, you know, what's the impact of your suppliers with respect to, um, you know, being able to produce your product? And, and it's possible that, you know, if it's a very complex biologic, um, they're going to have far more supplier power than uh, than a company that has uh, and that's developing, you know, a, a much more simpler um, chemical product. Um, the threat of substitution is, is another way of, of thinking about competition uh, with respect to other other substitutes and these would be you know often um, competitors that are already in the space with you know say another medical device that does a similar thing um, that has other advantages with with your product that, that you don't have design for uh, that where they might have patents around a specific area that, that you may not and uh, and again how do you think about that competition with respect to um, whether or not your value proposition is better than theirs and whether or not they can come in with a substitute product that will that will displace yours. The next tool uh, as well to think about the market and to think about um, you know, your differentiated competitive advantage of your product is, is a SWOT analysis. And so of course this is this is a very popular tool again uh, to think about um, you know where where your strengths and weaknesses are and where opportunities and threats may come from to disrupt uh, your particular product. So, so when thinking about you know, strengths, um, you're really thinking about what advantages your product has uh, to, to competitive products and, and where you are driving value or can potentially drive value uh, with your product. Uh, and of course, weaknesses are, are the opposite side of that same coin. Uh, similarly, in terms of external factors, you know, what are some of the opportunities that may come forward that may help um, to present those, some of those opportunities? And how do you approach some of those opportunities um, and really capitalize them in order to make your product um, or to best position your product in the market? And again, similarly, from a threats perspective, what are your competitors doing or what, are, uh, what is the market doing that may threaten um, the, the, the value of your product? So, so those feed really a lot um, into the market planning process. Um, again, this is a, a, another popular tool. We use quite, this quite a bit uh, at TAC that in terms of, again, thinking about what the market looks like. And so, um, you know, a lot of the, the previous tools that we had talked about feed into this process around thinking about what the environment is, um, whether or not there is a market need with respect to the product, and whether or not you are actually solving a real problem uh, in the market. Often, um, with respect to this particular part of the planning process, you know, researchers or entrepreneurs or companies uh, will do what's called a market opportunity assessment, and so they'll, uh, or or they'll they'll maybe hire a company or or within their own organization, they will do a study that looks at the market, that looks at um, uh, you know uh, incidents, for instance, of cancer, um, and looks at sort of where tre um, cancer treatment centers are for. Uh, this particular project, maybe it's uh, radiation therapy. And so what does that look like with respect to where those cancer treatment centers are um, and, and what's, the, what's the differentiation with respect to your, par your product in that market? Um, and what is the market size? And what is the penetration uh, associated with that market? Uh, and what sort of geographic factors may play into um, that particular market segment? And maybe geography is one way to segment the market, uh, but maybe there's another way to segment the market that makes it um, uh, that makes selling into that market different for your particular product. Uh, the other, the other component then to a market opportunity assessment is often um, primary research, and so reaching out to potential customers of your product uh, and speaking with them about whether or not this would displace um, existing technologies, whether or not they're aware of other technologies that might compete with yours, um, and from there really driving to uh, hopefully a recommendation and a conclusion on whether or not there is a market opportunity for your product. Um, and, and so this, this process um, is, is often used for, for this type of market assessment or market opportunity analysis. Um, and, and really this is done you know, in companies with multiple products um, for, for every product in that, uh, in that company. And so uh, it, it's just very, very important again to understand you know, what problem it is that you're solving and whether or not there is a market um, for your product before you start developing your product um, and spending a lot of money in understanding, um, you know, the milestones and, and product development strategy associated with that, uh, with that product. 
what are the other Sorry, minor, minor technical issue. Uh, one of the other um, th ways to think about customers with respect to particularly health technology companies is, um, is to think about patients uh, or the four P's of, 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 uh, of customers. So, so, you know, the health system is very, very unique in that um, the patient, um, the prescriber and the practitioner, the procurement agency within the health systems in the provinces as well as the payers are all very, very different which makes health technology um, procurement and purchasing very, very complex. And all of the needs of each of these customer groups need to be satisfied when thinking about um, how you look at your customers and how you get a product to market. Uh, and so um, certainly the advice that we give all of our healthcare companies is to think about you know, who, well, the power of the patient with respect to being able to purchase the product um, to think about practitioners and prescribers with respect to certainly therapeutics, um, but also you know the market access issues in terms of looking at how those products are purchased um, and who ultimately pays for those products and how what's your strategy with respect to um, uh, speaking with those particular groups around getting your product to market. So all of these things then feed into your business model. And so I had shown you a, a picture of a, a book and had mentioned the business model generation uh, book. Uh, and this is a tool um, that you use to think about your product or your business plan a little bit differently. And so the business canvas, the business model canvas is another, again, another, another process. Um, to think about how you might look at each of, of those components and how you bring them all together um, into a, a, a short summarized version of your business model uh, strategy. Um, this is one tool. Another tool um, is the growth uh, wheel. Uh, and again, uh, a process um, that exists that allows you to sort of think through each of the different components uh, of a business plan and how those components all come together uh, with respect to um, putting together a, a business model. And, and so those business models, again, are, are focused on understanding um, you know, what the plan is to be able to drive value out of your product and, um, and, and understanding that there is a plan to move forward. Um, now, now, the one thing I will say at this point is that business models, business models change all the time. Um, they need to be quite flexible in terms of being able to pivot. Um, and, and so it's important when you're thinking about the business model, uh, and it's important to understand when thinking about the business model, that these are doc the, the value in the document is really going through the process to think through each of these different components. Typically, after that's done, uh, the business model is actually set aside um, and is used as a guide to, 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 to the organization, to the entrepreneur, to the company in order to move this forward. Uh, and to, in order to move forward with the plan. And you can use the guide and the business model to then check um, what you've done um, against that plan uh, and modify it so that it better fits how external factors have changed or how internal factors have changed. Uh, the, the VRI model or VO model is again another tool um, to think about um, your product. But, but really the focus of this um, is to think about um, your long-term sustainable competitive differentiated advantage. So your your LTS CDA um, is critical in terms of thinking about whether or not your product has a long-term competitive advantage, uh, and whether or not there is uh, an advantage and and it makes sense to continue to push through uh, development of the product. Another tool that's also useful with respect to thinking about your product. Um, is what's called the GE McKinley nine box matrix. And so this is, um, you know, when you have multiple products, you have multiple projects, multiple technologies that you're developing, thinking about where in this box um, you may want to place your technologies, um, where between industry attractiveness and where the industry is going in general for that product, as well as the strength of the particular product uh, against other competitive products uh, within the industry uh, is a way to help with prioritization of, of uh, the projects and, and technologies um, in the system. So again, a, a different way of thinking about 
how to prioritize your products after you had a chance to go through and think about the various business planning tools um, to look at um, the opportunity in the market for, for your particular technology. And so all of these things are, are generally done for, for um, you know, by companies. These are very commonly, commonly used tools to, to help develop a business plan in order to think of where the technology might be value and how to be able to get that technology to market. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and just talk a little bit about valuation because I know that this is a topic that comes up quite often with respect to how, uh, how to think about um, the value of a patent or the value of technology. And one of the things I want to be clear right up front is that while most people think about valuation of a, of a technology as going from bottom left to top right, this is actually not how technology um, value comes around when you look at um, you know, investments. This is a much more typical model of how milestones um, impact the valuation of intellectual property. And so if you've got an intellectual property, you think about, um, let's say, a therapeutic. Um, the, the, the value of the therapeutic actually doesn't change until you get certain regulatory milestones met. Um, and so the stepwise um, process occurs where you know, as you achieve a, let's say, a clinical, a phase one clinical trial completion, uh, and that's successful, the, the value of the technology and the value of the IP and the value of the company actually bumps up as the result of clearing um, that particular milestone. Uh, and, and this is usually how early stage technology companies change in value as you continue to meet milestones. Um, after the, the technology is, is commercialized, after it's selling in the market, then that more typical um, revenue curve of bottom left to top right occurs. But during the development phase, really it's the achievement of milestones that increase the value of the, of the technology. And so that's critical when thinking about um, the development of the product and, and, and what you're able to achieve with respect to value of the IP as you complete specific milestones. And so that's relevant, again, with respect to um, why it's urgent to push the development of technologies forward as quickly as possible. So, so the, the, the curve here that you see is a pretty typical um, cash flow curve. So this is, you know, for a new company, um, uh, uh, the cash requirements for that company dip um, and, and you need to put cash in without generating revenue out. Um, and then after a certain point, you'll hit a break even where the company starts to generate its own cash. Um, and uh, it, it, it actually generates a profit over time. The challenge though with um, IP assets, particularly you know, in, in the technology industry is that, uh, and, and the life sciences industry, is that patents have uh, a, a shelf life. Um, patents are valid for 20 years. And, and the challenge is that um, we, we see lots and lots of examples of, of, of researchers who, who take their time in getting the product out the door. And, and the impact of that is over that 20 year period, and you can see that I've taken that last, that last graph and added some lines on the end, what you do as you continue to take time to develop the product is you actually shave the value of the intellectual property off at the back end, right? So this is, this is actually time that you are not able to generate cash flows because you have a valid patent as a result of, um, as a result of, of losing you know, X number of years um, because you haven't got the technology to market fast enough. And so when thinking about milestones, and then when thinking about the critical milestones in the development of the product, and when thinking about how quickly you need to get the product to market in order to not lose value in the back end of the intellectual property, it's, it's absolutely critical to think about um, moving products to market as quickly as possible. And so, you know, this is a, an example of, of uh, academic milestones. These are, these slides, these next two slides actually are, uh, are from my friend, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Vince, who's the chairman of biomedical engineering at the Cleveland Clinic. And, and he provides these two slides as an example of typically what we would see in, in academic timeline and milestones around, you know, progress reports um, and, and the progression of research and, and getting to publication. Where in the corporate world, this is a fairly typical um, picture of how corporations think about um, uh, you know milestones and timelines and how quickly and how um, 
closely, they, they are looking for that product to market. And, and so it, it, it's, a, it's a great example of, um, of uh, you know, how to think about milestones a bit differently with respect to getting those, those products to market. Uh, Jeff um, actually uh, was the, the VP of Clinical Affairs in Advanced R&D previous to his role at the Cleveland Clinic uh, with a company called Volcano. They were just acquired by uh, Philips for $1.2 billion uh, in 2014 around medical imaging. And so this picture actually is taken from, uh, from his company um, and, uh, and gives, again, a bit of a sense of the Gantt chart that they put together to get that product to market. So, so I want to end with, uh, with two slides. Um, and I know that I've gone through uh, you know, this, this topic quite quickly and, and a lot of the tools quite quickly. But I want to I end up here to basically say, um, you know, this is, this is one example. And the next slide will have another example from, from GSK around what they're looking for with respect to pitching and communicating with industry. Um, but this is a pretty good example of, of some of the some of the core. And I hope that you have some examples of tools that you might be able to, to look through in terms of process to be able to think about your innovation, to think about your technology, to think about your IP, and how you might be able to um, drive that forward and have you know, a very fruitful communication with, with the industry. Uh, another example um, is uh, oh, Marshall. I've actually lost uh, control of the deck. You should have it back now. Oh, there we go. So, uh, so GlaxoSmithKline, in terms of their pitch template, um, provides the following suggestions as well. Think about, um, you know, your 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 deck when presenting to to industry, um, and look at, you know, whether or not you can you can hit these particular points around the therapeutic hypothesis, of course, um, but whether or not there's a product that's defined for for the intellectual property and and um, and how that might be related. To talk a little bit about product status and, and that enabling expertise. Uh, as well as to talk about tractability. So really thinking about the development for the product, uh, really thinking about um, you know, your plans for commercialization associated with that, as well as what your requirements are for the partner contribution. Uh, and with that, um, I'm going to uh, end up on the last slide, which I, I'm going to say is the key messages slide. Um, and really, again, it's around thinking about um, the opportunities that are available, thinking about how you communicate uh, that particular plan to get uh, to get the technology to market, um, and what that might look like, and, and where the value is with respect to that product uh, as you communicate uh, that opportunity. Jason, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, we this is our first uh, first in a series, and you've provided us with an amazing overview of some of the considerations that are uh, applicable, practical, and we should try them at home in terms of our thinking about our endpoints for allergen uh, IP and what, what's the next step in terms of commercialization and knowledge mobilization. But I think it's also very applicable in the context of even making choices about what research we're planning to invest in and where re our researchers and our trainees should be investing their time. So a lot of these considerations have broad applicability and uh, you know what a, a wonderful overview you've provided us with this toolkit that we I think we'll probably be drilling down in into uh, over the next uh, three or four months as we have various follow-on uh, webinars. So thank you so much for that. And I'd like to open it up now to our participants, and maybe, Marshall, you can put the Q&A slide up and um, invite uh, questions from our audience. So um, does anyone have a question for Jason about any of the slides, any of the tools, or uh, just anything in general? We so have a couple Raise your of, hand. Mm -hmm. I okay. have a couple of questions to read out. I'm just... Uh, trying to manipulate my control panel because they're hard to view. The first question from uh, Natalia Mikalova is, what is the process for getting a technology covered by health insurance in Canada and the US? 
<laughs> so, so that, that's that's a very big question. Um, you know what? The, the and that's probably actually too long of a question to try to answer here. I, I mean, I, I think uh, the processes are very very different. Um, there's a lot of we'll call it health technology assessment work and health economics work that goes into you know even after a drug is approved um, by uh, regulatory agencies for safety and efficacy. Um, whether or not you know the impact of the results of those clinical trials are uh, considered to be a benefit, and where that that cost benefit process lo lies um, is uh, is quite complex. And so there's there's quite a bit of submission work and quite a bit of negotiation work that happens after um, after that process. Um, there is uh, there are federal bodies um, uh, that that look after that negotiation process. Uh, and and it, it takes quite a while. Even after a drug is approved by the FDA or by Health Canada, it takes quite some time uh, still to be able to get those drugs uh, approved uh, and used in the in the market. Okay, thank but, you. But Jim. certainly, a, a good question to ask. You know, a, a regulatory agent, um, and, and a good a good question to ask for someone who has uh, a, a experience in market access uh, and government relations work. Okay. Next question, Marshall. Beth Davis would like to ask a question now. Beth, you're unmuted if you wish to speak. Sorry, no, I don't have a question. Ah, sorry, your hand was raised. Anyone else with a question? It's Diana Marshall. I, um, Jason, what... Um, What's the most valuable thing that you've learned from your years of working with researchers and entrepreneurs in terms of uh, a blind spot that they might have, things that they might not even know they don't know that are really important to them moving forward with their research to try to translate that into a product or service? Yeah, uh, interesting question. Uh, so having worked with a lot of researchers, I, I, researchers are, are wonderfully um, fantastic at asking great questions. And um, and so what that usually means is that there are there are many 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 more questions that can be asked around uh, any sort of intellectual property that's developed. And what I often see is um, you know and this might be a bit of a difference between between not all researchers but, but many researchers and, and many entrepreneurs um, is is after that and I sort of talk about this in in the slide deck after intellectual property is uh, developed um, often you know. I, Continue to be asked around the product um, without uh, without necessarily getting that product to market. And I think um, you know the most valuable thing that I've seen is um, is is entrepreneurs who are able to really think about the critical path to getting a product to market, understanding you know for instance what the regulatory hurdles are, uh, what studies need to be done in order to get the past those regulatory hurdles, um, and really prove out the value of the product. Um, and driving to driving to that in, in software, um, that's that's often called minimum viable product. So, what is the minimum viable product that that I can put out there to be able to to um, that that's better, I should say, than um, what's existing in the market right now uh, that will show value and to be able to get that out. And often I see um, you know individuals who who want to continue to improve, who think about different ways to improve the. Um, without necessarily thinking about how to get you know generation one on uh, before before getting generation two, three, and four off the market. Mm -hmm. So another way of I'm just going to follow on with that, and we often hear that from the NC program itself. It's a challenge everyone has in the research community. There's so many different questions you can ask, and every result generates more questions. The NC program really tells us to focus. What is your focus? And I think that's really what you're getting to is that if we're going to move things forward, we have to focus on a more narrow uh, scope and scale of uh, issues in order to be successful. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and, and it's critical. I mean, the goals are different, and I think you have to think about your goals and, and what you want to do. When thinking about um, you know how you want to how you want to shape your focus, 
Um, but if the focus and, and ultimately the, the end result is to get a product to market, um, that is a, a, a different path, I think, than um, you know, wanting to dig into the science. I have another question. This is from Sylviane Duval, and the question is, universities such as Manitoba seem to be moving away from commercializing IP the traditional way because the patent process is a time-consuming money hog. What other avenues do you suggest for knowledge that has value, but maybe only short-term use? Uh, so, I mean, knowledge is, um, and so commercialization, commercialization is very, very different from knowledge translation, right? And so, it's it's a great question in in sort of what the goal is in order to in order to get products uh, or knowledge translated out of the research that you're that you're working on, um, and we certainly see um, that differentiated in uh, different tools, um, you know, algorithms and th and thinking about how things uh, how decisions might be made or decision aid tools, um, which don't need to necessarily have intellectual property rights attached to them. But, but have a tremendous value, social value to the system around, um, around uh, you know, how, how healthcare, for instance, is delivered in, in the system. So, so there's lots and lots of ways to translate knowledge. Um, there are, um, and, and all, of those, all of those methods, um, you know, and, and that was an example in terms of a decision aid tool, all of those are valuable to the system. And I think those things need to continue to be done in order to drive benefits in the system quickly. Uh, on the other hand, you know, when you're thinking about a product and you're thinking about, um, you know, manufacturing behind a product, marketing behind a product, the cost of doing clinical trials, let's say, for a therapeutic that, that right now are sitting somewhere between 600, 700 million dollars to a billion dollars in order to get through the safety and efficacy trials, that that entire process is um, very, very expensive. Um, it's often, you know, the, the only way. Um, to be able to get a product to market, given you know all of the manufacturing costs and, and the regulatory components around GMP manufacturing and all the rest of it, you know without all of that, you would never be able to get that product that therapeutic to market. And so I think depending on the nature of the intellectual property, depending on the nature of you know the knowledge that you're translating, there are different ways to be able to get that to benefit society. Um, it's just. Um, you know, the, the path was very different and, and there is some consideration around, you know, which way you go. Jason, it's Diana. Just to follow on to that answer, um, what are the strategies if you have a tool, are there ways that we should be, we as researchers, when we discover an algorithm that supports decision making, what are the strategies available to us in terms of um, monetizing tools that we develop? If there's no IP, what are the other strategies we can think of to um, recover some of our costs and perhaps uh, generate a, a revenue flow that we can reinvest in our research program? It's a great question. We've had this discussion with, with quite a few of our researchers uh, here locally. I would say that it's pretty tough. If you, if you, just, if, you have, if you pull together, so if you have one decision aid tool, um, it became it becomes very very difficult to monetize that um, outside of let's say grant funding. But to commercially try to get someone to pay for the decision tool is, is very difficult. And once the decision tool is there, you know, let's say if it's used by physicians or if it's used by healthcare practitioners um, without you know payment, you know often. I mean, there's no one who's going to sue them because they're using that decision tool in order to, um, in order to make the best investigation simply because they're on. Yeah, I don't know. Marshall, um, I'm not sure if Jason got cut off there, but um, do you want it to appears he, next question? It appears he did. I, we don't have any uh, outstanding questions at the moment. Okay. Um, is, Jason, are you on the line, though? Okay, he may have to call back in. He may do, yes. He's shown as still connected to the webinar, but I think his audio has gone down. 
might be the okay. same technical issue he confronted earlier. Okay, great. Is there anyone on the line that would like to make any comments? Do we have any trainees on the line who would like to um, just make a comment about um, how this, how they might apply some of these tools to what they're doing or what to what's going on in their labs? Please feel free just to raise your hand, clicking that button on your control panel if you wish to speak. I heard a beep. Maybe that's Jason joining back. Jason, are you back? It is. I apologize. Somehow my, my phone disconnected. Sorry about that. Oh, it's okay. All right. So are there any additional questions? Marshall, has anything come in yet? From the group. It's not a question for Jason per se. There's just someone asking if uh, the talk will be available for later viewing. And in fact, yes, we're planning to archive it on our, our website. An announcement will uh, will be circulated about that when it's available. That sounds good. So this will be a, a resource on the Allergen website where there are many resources for uh, our researchers and trainees uh, about commercialization and knowledge mobilization. Um, Jason, I have another question for you. Uh, what are the trends that you're seeing that will affect researchers being able to secure funding in the future? I think we're, we're experiencing a bit of a sea change right now in terms of the research environment in Canada. And what are the trends that you're seeing in terms of pull of research out of the university, access to additional funds, and what are those sources? But what are you seeing in terms of your broader practice and your work at Tech Edmonton in terms of short, medium, and long-term trends that might be uh, important to be aware of from a researcher and a trainee perspective? Federally, it'll be interesting to see with the results of the, the, the election as to how things might change. Um, certainly, there was a lot of discussion um, by politicians this last round around um, continue to fund basic research and to, and to add to that funding. And so it'll be interesting to see how that's done or, or whether that's done and, and how that commitment is, is going to be followed through and the discussion around that. Um, certainly there's been um, quite a few quite a few changes to you know how, how dollars are contributed and, and what's being asked for with respect to uh, commercialization attached to um, you know, funding that, that's coming through. And, and I, I think that 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 funding is here to stay. I certainly think that um, you know we've been we've been criticized as a country for not being able to translate effectively. Um, you know, in in some cases, in many cases, um, research that's done here, even though we're recognized as a leading country and the quality of the research that's produced in this country. Um, and so, I think I think that that funding is here to stay with respect to um, thinking about commercialization and knowledge translation. Um, and, and and how then um, how, how that changes again at the federal level? I'm not sure. Pro provincially, um, I think um, I, I I actually think that um, you know, and, I, and I'm speaking maybe a little bit to, to Alberta here more than more than other provinces. Um, there is lots and lots of an increase, I think, support for technology companies. Um, and uh, and being able to translate some of that that research, I, I certainly see increased funding again um, for for health researchers in Alberta, um, but again tied to commercialization milestones and outcomes. And mm -hmm. so I I, I think that, um, um, that 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 trend is here to stay, um, but whether or not um, it continues to increase in that in that fashion, or whether or not it continues to, to it flattens out and there's more. Um, money provided to basic research, uh, I think that remains to be seen. Great, thank you. I think we certainly, you know, are on the front, we're on the leading edge within the NC program of this trend, and I, I completely agree with you that the research grant applications themselves are becoming more and more NCE oriented, more outcome oriented, requesting more strategic uh, focus, uh, and there's you know, less sort of curiosity driven, oh, let's just see what we find kind of funding opportunities out there. So I think this toolkit that you've given us, just even being able to define that value proposition piece for our research grants is becoming increasingly expected 
of us as a community. And it's in addition to the um, intellectual or scientific value of it, but it's, it's going that next step in terms of, well, so what, who cares? <laughs> um, and that, I don't think that, you know, 15 years ago was part and parcel of, of most research applications in the scientific field. So it's... Yeah, agreed. Um, mm -hmm. So um, in the last minute or two, if you could give some advice to our um, our community and especially to our young uh, people who are currently studying or are uh, building their skills and expertise early in their career, what kind of advice would you give them um, in the context of the academic, commercial, and business opportunities that might be available to them in healthcare, in um, your field of uh, business development, you know, what's out there that's exciting and where people with lots of energy and skills are needed in the next five to ten years? You know, one, one of the things I would say in Canada that we're excellent at is, um, is you know, the, the, the research component and actually seeding companies. So, so we have a lot of very young companies in Canada that, um, that, that are around. I think um, you know, where, where things go from here is, is in question around whether or not we have the capacity to scale companies up. And so, you know, a lot of the a lot of the skill sets. I mean, if if, if industry is an in interest, um, certainly you know, the the thinking about you know marketing skills uh, and the ability to grow companies, um, manufacturing, and again some of that regulatory components. Those are all skill sets that are critical. That I think we have um, a shortage of in Canada. Um, certainly, uh, given the cost of of healthcare and delivering healthcare to patients. Um, the other the other component that I think con continues to be increasingly important is is one around health health technology assessment and understanding how um, you know technologies may impact uh, existing workflows and and patient outcomes and and cost um, cost of the system and of course related to that is is that health economics piece and so you know a, a, an individual with a very strong research background with an ability to to think about um, how that might interact with costs of the system, and how that might play out, um, you know, in terms of uh, again that, that that patient outcome quality uh, adjustment to to patients, uh, as well as um, you know cost cost of the overall system and how that might be factored in, and and again not just thinking about um, in a siloed approach, uh, you know, drug cost to you know a drug plan. But really thinking about a <laughs> drug and thinking, okay, if we give them to, if, if we give them this particular product, this particular therapeutic at this point in time, what's the impact to the system overall with respect to, um, you know, stays in beds or or hospital visits or um, you know the impact of quality of life for the patient? But those are, I think, are are some emerging fields that are coming through in, in healthcare. Um, that are going to have a big impact, I think, on on how we think about health health delivery in the future. Well, Jason, on that note, I'm going to conclude this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who attended. We hope you enjoyed the content of today's discussion and you found that useful. Uh, Marshall, maybe you put up the slide showing our upcoming um, up and coming events in terms of this webinar series. So uh, please register for additional events and let us know how you felt about this webinar. It's our first one. We'd love your feedback. There will be a survey that you'll be prompted to reply to. It's short and we would really like to hear from you. Um, again, don't forget to register for the upcoming um, sessions that you find interesting because space is limited. Jason, again, thank you so very much for wealth of expertise with us. This is an amazing toolkit that you've provided us with and it will be extremely valuable as we move forward and build our own skill sets in these areas. Um, there's no um, there's no way around learning to do these things by doing them. And so we really appreciate your advice, your help, and your expertise. Thanks for sharing it with us and thank you all for participating.